Okay. Well, uh, first of all, I want to thank everybody. I hope you could all hear me okay um, and see me. I'm not sure that I need to have these headphones on, but uh, I, it, I think it makes my hair look less goofy, so I think I'll keep them on for a while. <clears throat> so first of all, I, again, I want to thank everybody for joining me, and I particularly want to thank everybody for all the amazing support that I've received over the last week or so. I've had, I don't know how many emails and messages and, uh, you know, people giving me best wishes and sending me greetings and things. So I really appreciate that. And it's, it's a very heartwarming experience for me to, to go through that. So um, the other thing I want to say is, uh, just to start, is I had, I had the opportunity to um, do a similar uh, talk about this last night. And what I realized is that this took me more than a half an hour. So with your permission, uh, I'm going to, this introductory part may be more than a half an hour. In fact, I expect that it will. And I, I have looked at most of the questions that were sent. And I think most of the questions will be answered in my introductory statements. So I know we can't get to all the questions. We got at least hundreds. I don't know how many hundreds of questions. A lot of them, of course, were similar. Uh, but uh, again, hopefully many, if not all of them, will be addressed. And then there will be time for some questions afterwards. Uh, the next thing I want to say is, you know, it's customary when people give medical talks to give references. And uh, it's all I can say is I, I, I'm going to give you places to uh, references to read where all these things that I say can be found. But I'm not going to take the time to cite uh, literature studies uh, during the talk. It's just too distracting, and I don't think it's necessary. So the places to look, and in particular, if there's any medical professionals or healthcare professionals out there who want to check on things, I would strongly advise you to check out these sources that I'm going to say, uh, particularly before you ask me any further questions. Uh, there's just so many questions now that I would really rather you check these out. You can find all the references, all the citations that you need in these. And the first one is a book by a fellow that I met named Klaus Kohnlein, K-O-H-N-L-E-I-N, and Torsten Engelbrecht. And the book is called Virus Mania. That's Virus Mania by Klaus Kohnlein. Uh, the second is a website by uh, that's called theinfectiousmyth.com, and there's a lot of good references, particularly about the current situation on, in there. Uh, the third one is a book called The Silent Revolution in Cancer and AIDS Medicine by a German named Heinrich Kremer, K-R-E-M-E-R, -E and there's a lot of citations about medical therapy, um, and viral therapy in there. So everybody should take a look at that. Uh, the next one is the book called The Invisible Rainbow by Arthur Furstenberg. And that's specifically talking about the uh, health consequences of electromagnetic fields. And I got a lot of questions about um, the reference for when I mentioned that uh, about Ru what Rudolf Steiner said about um, viruses. And that quote came from a lecture series called Cosmic Working of Earth and Man. So that's Cosmic Workings, sorry, Workings of Earth and Man. And then uh, later on, I'll refer to a, uh, a talk that was given at the NIH. They have an annual talk uh, to update um, essentially the NIH about the state of virology. This talk was given at the NIH on June 4th, 2015. The uh, doctor who gave it was named Skip Virgin, and the title of the talk was called, quote, 
the mammalian virome in genetic analysis of health and disease pathogenesis. And I can tell you it's not an easy listen, uh, it's very technical, but for anybody who's really interested in going deeper into that subject, I would say you, you really must listen to that. Uh, the next introductory thing I'm going to say is uh, a number of years ago, I wrote a book called Human Heart, Cosmic Heart, and uh, that's our website, humanheartcosmicheart.com. And in there, I made the, what I thought was controversial statement at the time, saying that, in my opinion, the heart does not pump the blood. Now, I would just point out that right now there's two people around in the country, in the United States anyways, saying the heart does not pump the blood. There's another reason why the blood moves in the body. There's uh, me and an, an anesthesiologist named Bronco First. And he wrote a book called The Heart and Circulation. And the foreword to that book was written by a, the head of cardiac anesthesiology at Harvard Medical School, who basically said Bronco is correct and it's not possible that the heart pumps the blood. And so I, as I've often said, I may be wrong, but apparently at least I'm not the only one wrong about this. And the reason I bring that up right now is I, uh, in the front of that book, I wrote a quote from a guy named Victor Schauberger, who many think, including me, probably knows more about water than any human being who ever lived. And I'm going to read that quote because I, I thought it was appropriate for the heart book, and I have a feeling it's even more appropriate for right now. So this is a quote from Victor Schauberger. Uh, quote, people may say I am crazy. Perhaps they are right. In this case, it is not so much important if there is one fool more or less in the world. But in case that I am right and science is wrong, Lord have mercy on mankind. So I just want to start with that as a way to say, obviously, this is my opinion. This is my take on the situation. And uh, Everybody is free to make of it what they want and investigate it further, and I hope that people do that. So the place I'm going to start here is we, we have this situation in the world where apparently there's a lot of people getting sick, and it started in a place called Wuhan, China, and now it, then uh, there was some other main places like in northern Italy, and then essentially all around the world, or at least a lot of places in the world, there's a lot of people getting sick. So the question is, why are they getting sick? And of course, the usual theory that we're all being told is that uh, there is this new sort of novel virus called a coronavirus, and that is the cause of why everybody is getting sick. And I thought that the first step here is we should look at um, the history of how we know that a certain disease or a certain set of symptoms is caused by a microorganism at all, and then specifically by a virus, uh, because that's really the place to start. And so the way that I would explain that and this is basically formulated in a set of postulates that started in the uh, essentially the early part of the latter of the last century, and they're called Koch's postulates. And these are accepted the accepted way we prove that any set of symptoms is caused by a infectious agent, and they're used and essentially approved by all the infectious disease people and virologist in the world. Um, so Koch's postulates are basically four. And let's take a very simple example so that everybody can understand this. The first postulate is that people have essentially the same set of symptoms. And so let's take the example of meningococcal meningitis. That's a, a type of meningitis that's caused by a bacteria called meningococcus. And essentially, all the people with that meningococcal meningitis, they have a high fever, they're extremely sick, they have a very characteristic rash, 
And if nothing is done, and even sometimes if, what, if anything is done, they will die in two to three days. And that's 100% of the people have the identical symptoms. Now, once you have a person with those symptoms, you can take some of their blood and you can do what we call a blood culture where we attempt to grow an organism out of their blood. And what you find is 100% of those people with meningococcal meningitis grow out a culture of pure meningococcus in their blood, 100% not 50%, not 80%, 100%. The next thing, and that's postulate number two. Postulate number one is people have more or less the same symptoms. Postulate number two is that in those people with the symptoms, they all have the same organism and only that organism growing out in their blood. Postulate number three is that none of the people walking around who are normal, presumably like most of us, um, none of us have meningococcus growing in our blood. It's simply not compatible with normal health. So that's postulate number three. Postulate number four is once you have a pure culture of meningococcus um, and you grow it out, you can isolate and purify that bacteria you can then inject it or expose another person, which you wouldn't want to do, or an animal who's susceptible to that bacteria. And 100% of them will get meningococcal disease. And then 100% of those, you can then grow out meningococcus in their blood. And then you could keep that thing going basically forever. Now, let me just stop here for a minute because I realize that this talk uh, is going to get very technical for some. And frankly, I just don't know other, any other way to do it because this is the things that I think you need to know. So in other words, to summarize, the way we, improve, we uh, prove infectious etiology or infectious causation is we have people with the same or very similar symptoms. We grow out a pure culture of that uh, organism, whatever it is that's causing it from the blood or the respiratory secretions, and only that organism is found. Then we take that organism, we purify it, we inject it into a susceptible animal and they get the same disease, and then we culture that organism out from them. And that proves that it's, uh, that organism caused that disease. Now, you can do the same thing with viruses. So let's take an example of chickenpox. It's a common childhood viral infection. More or less, every child with chickenpox has the same set of symptoms. They have a low-grade fever. Sometimes it's a little higher. They don't feel so good. They have a vesicular or bubbly rash. And that's how we know it's chickenpox. Now, you can then take the blood or the uh, the this fluid from these bubbles, and you can look at it under an electron microscope, and you will find millions of copies of the virus in the blood, that's called viremia, or you can find thousands, maybe millions of copies from the bubbles, uh, the blisters on their skin. You don't find any other virus, you find a pure culture of this chickenpox virus from either the blood or the vesicles. You can then look at the uh, at normal people, sorry, I misspoke about third postulate with meningococcus, is no normal people have meningococcus growing in the blood. Similarly with chickenpox, there's no normal people like you or I walking around who have millions of copies of, of chickenpox virus in our blood and we don't have any of these vesicles. And if we do have a, had a blister, it wouldn't have any chickenpox virus in it. And then number four, the fourth postulate, is you could take some of this virus, you could purify it. And when I say purify it, I mean you, you, you do something to it, filter it or whatever, so that the only thing you're injecting or exposing the animal to is a pure culture of chickenpox virus and then 100% of them who are not immune, they will get sick, they will have chickenpox virus in their blood and then their blisters, and then so on. 
That is how all doctors, all virologists, all infectious disease people understand how to prove an infectious origin. Now, uh, there's a long history of this, uh, which I just going to briefly mention because when you look at what's happening in, uh, with this so-called coronavirus epidemic, the first thing you notice is this started in Wuhan, we're told. And then you say, what were the symptoms of the people in Wuhan? So the best that we know of, the symptoms were low-grade fever and dry cough. Now, unfortunately, or maybe not unfortunately, but realistically, that is not a very specific set of symptoms. Lots of people have low-grade fever and dry cough, including people who have bronchitis, including people sometimes with asthma, people with, uh, exposed to air pollution, and a whole host of other things. So that, it, that first postulate, everybody has the same symptoms, is actually not met in this situation. And so then, uh, the next thing is do all those people, okay, so maybe they all have a low grade fever and dry cough and, and that's just what it is. What should have happened and what, um, if I was the CDC expert and I was called to investigate or if, there, if you call the Chinese virology authorities or the American virology authorities, if you say, there's a, it looks like a new disease. There's people who have a dry cough and low-grade fever and the shadowing on their CT scans of their lungs. We've never seen that before. Can you come and investigate uh, to see if there's an infectious etiology? Okay, fair enough. So what I want you to do is line up 500 people all with that same symptoms, and we're going to do an electron microscopy examination of their sputum and their blood, and we're gonna find out if all of them have millions of copies of this, uh, of a virus, and then we're gonna characterize the virus and, and see what happens. The next thing I would do is I would ask them to take 500 people who are perfectly normal, because you need a control in this, and say, let's look at their blood and their sputum and see how many of them have millions of copies of the virus in their blood or their respiratory secretions. And the answer should be 100% of the first 500 have millions of copies and zero of the second group have this millions of copies. Then we would purify those uh, millions of copies of the virus from the first group find a susceptible animal and either inject it or put it in their nose or squirt it down their throat. We would do then a control. So we would take a saline solution or something like that and do the same thing, except it didn't have the virus. And if all of them got sick and all of them had a millions of copies, we would prove that this was because of this new virus. So that's how this quote should have been done. Now let's look at how it was done. As far as we know, and where I'm getting this from is a search for PubMed, a search for articles, and people are sending me things to corroborate this, and so I would go to infectiousmyth.com. As far as we know, not only are there not 500 people who had this done, as far as I can tell, there was nobody who had this done. There was not a single person who had uh, these symptoms, who had millions of copies of coronavirus isolated from their blood or sputum. What they said was, and what they published, and I've seen the articles, is we have people who are sick, here's a smear of their electron microscopy examination, and you see lots of things. You see cellular debris, you see a number of different things that look like viruses, and one of them looks like a coronavirus. So that's a completely different story than what I described for meningococcus or chickenpox. So, and then they did not do an examination, an electron microscope of 500 normal people. They simply didn't do it. Uh, now, the people who wrote the articles then said, and I quote, 
we did not attempt to purify the virus, which if you think about it is mind boggling because if they didn't, if they didn't purify the virus, how do they know that that was the cause of the disease? And the answer is there's no way to know that. But they did take the virus and they did a genetic sequence of it. The, the genetic material of a coronavirus is RNA, not DNA. And they said, this is a new genetic sequence which we haven't seen in a coronavirus before. Therefore, this is the cause of the disease. And all I can say is this flies in the face of everything we know about virology and infectious causation. And I would also point out that this is not the first time this has happened. In fact, it happens basically every time. And let me just give you one example. Around the, the later part of the 1800s, there was people showing up with a new set of symptoms of acute paralysis, and eventually that was called polio. And because this was the time of Pasteur and the whole inauguration of the germ theory, by the way, as many of you probably know, uh, apparently Pasteur recanted the germ theory and eventually said the germ is nothing, it's all the terrain or the experience of the person. But let's skip that for a minute. So they had these bunch of people with the symptoms of acute paralysis, that's what we call polio. Um, it also was the time when they were first spraying the orchards and the apple trees with something called lead arsenic. Now, the part of your body that has the pathology, the part that's sick, is called the anterior horn cells of the nervous system. That's why you get paralysis. It turns out that lead arsenic and then later DDT are very specific poisons for exactly that part of, of the nervous system. So anyways, they said, well, this must be an infection. So what they did, and I would say what they did, believe it or not, but again, if you go to the Virus Mania book, you will see the entire documentation of this, is they took children who were paralyzed and some who had died, and they extracted some of their spinal cord that was diseased or their uh, brain tissue after they died. They basically chopped it up like in a blender. They didn't purify it. They didn't see a virus. They didn't have electron microscopes then, so they couldn't see a virus. They didn't see a bacteria. They didn't even filter it. They just took this chopped up, essentially uh, spinal cord tissue and gave it to monkeys to drink. But interestingly, nothing happened. And that was one of the big conundrums of this polio virus uh, situation is they couldn't find a, an animal that they could make sick. So then they injected it subcutaneously like we could give a vaccine. Uh, and they injected it subcutaneously into the arms of monkeys and none of them got sick. So then they decided we have to prove that this is an infectious disease. So they took a child who was paralyzed. They took some of the diseased anterior horn cells from the nervous system. They chopped it up, took two monkeys, drilled holes in their skulls, and injected about a quarter of a cup of unpurified spinal fluid goop into their brains. One of the monkeys died. The other one became paralyzed. You can see a picture of the researcher who is uh, crowned as one of the shining lights of infectious disease, holding up the monkey, saying, this paralyzed monkey proves that it's an infectious disease. Now, I would say, if you ask me what to make of that study, I would say that if I was a monkey and somebody came at me with a bunch of goop from somebody who just died or had a disease in their spinal cord, and said, I want to drill a hole in your brain and inject it in. If I was the monkey, I would run away as fast as I could. Because clearly that proves nothing. Now, this same thing was, uh, the same failure of evidence was done with the H1N1 situation. It was done with the H5N1 situation. It was done with SARS. It was done with Hep C. It was done with Ebola virus. 
It was done with Zika virus. This is not the first rodeo for the failure of the infectious disease community to, to follow the actual laws and rules that they set up to prove infectious etiology. So that's the first thing that I think everybody must understand. Now, a lot of you and a lot of people ask me the question, well, but don't we have a test that shows that this is caused by this virus? Now, sometimes, because I have a little bit of a smart alecky tendency, I must admit, I ask the people, do you know what the test was? Or do you know what the test is? So far, essentially, nobody has known what the test is. The test is called a RT-PCR test. It's otherwise known as a viral load test. And the test is a surrogate test. It was, it was developed and by a guy named Kerry Mullis, who was given the Nobel Prize in Chemistry for essentially inventing the technique of this test. And he said very specifically, you cannot use this test to either prove infectious etiology or to diagnose an infectious disease, which of course is interesting because if you can't use it to diagnose an infectious disease, that of course begs the question of what can you use it for? But let me back up here and describe what a surrogate test means, because this is very important to understanding the situation we're currently in. Uh, a surrogate test means that in a situation where you're trying to prove causation, you have to have a gold standard test. And those postulates, like with meningococcus, that is a gold standard test. It's reliable 100% of the time. And as some people know, I like to speak in analogies here. So here's a way to understand this. Let's say you want to go to a town and you want to know how many feet there are in that town. And I don't mean inches and meters, I mean the feet at the bottom of your legs, right? So the question is, how many feet are there in Podunk, Alaska? So obviously the gold standard test for that is to go to the town have everybody come to the town square and then count their feet. So then you have 1,112 feet and you know that that's accurate. And then you go to the next town and you say, okay, everybody come to the center, 100% of the people come, you count their feet and there's 3,240 feet. You do that three or four times and you've now established a 100% foolproof way of knowing how many feet there are in that town. Now, in that situation, you can use a surrogate test. And so what do I mean by a surrogate test? Then you say, well, I don't wanna count everybody's feet. I know that everybody who has a foot has a shoe and everybody who has a shoe has a shoelace and, and there's only one shoe store in town that sells shoelaces. So I'm gonna to go to that shoe store and see how many people uh, bought shoelaces this year, and that's going to tell me how many feet there are. That's what's called a surrogate test. Now, the problem with a surrogate test is every one of those assumptions better be correct. So, for instance, how do you know everybody has bought shoes? Because maybe somebody doesn't like shoes. And then how do you know that everybody only has one pair of shoes? I've heard there's women who like four pairs or six pairs. And what about if some of the shoes like my have a pair of shoes that doesn't have shoelaces? So what happens with that? And the, the, the point of that is, unless you know all of those things, and unless you have a gold standard to which to compare it to, you cannot use a surrogate test to prove anything. And that is what is happening with these tests. So what is the surrogate test? So remember that we don't have a gold standard. We don't have isolation, purification, reinfection. We don't have viremia. We don't have millions of copies demonstrated on an electron microscope. We essentially have no idea who has this coronavirus disease. So then they take a piece of one of the coronaviruses, the new one that they found. It has a new RNA sequence that hasn't been found before. They take one of the sequences, which they say 
is unique to that particular virus, and they do something called amplify it. And what that means is you take it in, in your blood, you'll have one copy of this sequence, and it's too small, you can't find it. So you stimulate it, and this is what Carrie Mullis came up with. You stimulate it, it makes two copies, that's one cycle. You make four copies, that's two. You make uh, two to the 20th copies, whatever number that is, that's 20 cycles. And what you find with this test is that once you put it through approximately 36 cycles, then you start to see the color change that tells you it's positive. So if you do 35 cycles, it's still too small to see. If you do 36, you start to see it, but you get false negatives, even though you don't really know which is a false negative because you don't have anything to compare it with. So then you do 37 and you see it, you know, 5% of the time of people with these symptoms and you say, that's the number. But here's where it gets interesting. If you do it 40 times, you start seeing a lot more positives. And then here's something else to know. If you do it 60 times, so if you amplify it over and over and over again, it becomes positive with 100% of the people. Let me say that again. If you amplify it 60 times, it will be positive with everybody. That means that everybody has a piece of this RNA somewhere in their cells or in their genome or somewhere in their secretions. If you, all you have to do is amplify it enough. And the problem is we don't know how many false positives or false, false negatives there are because we have nothing to compare it to. And if the, you know, all biological tests have false positives. So if you test 30 million people and you have a 1% false positive rate, then 300,000 people by definition will test positive and then you have an epidemic. And then if you want to demonstrate that the epidemic got better, all you have to do is lower the amplification cycles to 35 and then suddenly your you know, vitamin C or your vaccine or your chloroquine or whatever you did worked and now there's no more people testing positive. That is fraught with problems and that is the problem. And unfortunately, with every country has their own standard of what kind of cycles they put it through the number. So you see very different numbers coming out of very different places depending on on the number of amplification cycles that they're standardizing their test to. And I hope everybody is getting the point that this is a crazy situation. Now, let me go to the next thing. Because a lot of times when I say to people, um, well, how do you know this is a virus? And then the first thing they say to me usually is, well, what else could it be? And I would contend that by definition, in a way, that is the wrong question. And let me give you another example of that. Again, let's say you go to Lubbock, Texas, and every morning at eight o'clock, you run around the track maybe six times, and the inside of the track is a football field like most uh, tracks are, and the football field is made of grass. And every day you run around the track, and that's fine. And then one morning you go there at eight, and there's a five-story boulder in the middle of the grassy field that covers about half of the track. But underneath that uh, boulder, there's, the grass is perfectly normal, perfectly normal. And then you go home and think, man, I don't know what happened there. I don't know how that boulder got there. And then you hear on the news in Lubbock, Texas, and I don't mean to pick on Lubbock, Texas, but a boulder fell from the sky it's probably a meteor and landed in Lubbock, in the football field in Lubbock, Texas. And I think most of us would say to yourself, hey, wait a minute. If a thing like that fell from the sky, like a meteor, I would expect there to be a hole or a crater or the grass would be messed up or something. But in fact, there was nothing like that. And so I think you would be skeptical of the, of the explanation. And then if somebody said, well, so what did happen? And you might say, I don't know, I wasn't there. 
maybe somebody put it there with a with a forklift or maybe the fairies dropped it there and they did it very carefully or i don't know what happened but i know that what you're saying is supposedly happened that didn't happen and the reason i say that now is because the first part of this i hope i explained the fact that we should all at least be skeptical if not actually look into how do you prove a virus exists and did the people running this actually prove that and so now let's get into uh, what is admittedly a bit of speculation as to what may be accounting for this problem now the first thing i want to say is you know i have no particular privy information to how bad it is or what's going to happen or you know are the statistics right that you know i've heard statistics that the mortality rate in italy and in china actually hasn't gone up you know that they track it year or month to month week to week over a number of years they call that excess mortality and there hasn't been excess mortality but it's possible that that's wrong and maybe there is it's possible it will happen later I don't know, um, and I don't pretend to know things that, that other people don't know just because of this. I, I just don't know. So let's just say something is happening, and maybe that something is actually going to be a real problem, which, by the way, is unlike what was predicted with things like Ebola and Zika and H5N1 and those things. Both, both of those, or all of those, we were basically going to, every child born from now on was gonna be born with a small head, and we were all gonna die of H5N1, according to Fauci, he said something like 10% or so, or it was gonna be a huge catastrophe, and it didn't happen. But it's possible it would happen, and again, I don't know. But let's speculate on, on what could be happening. And in order to know that, we have to get deeper into the theory of what is a virus? What actually do we know? And here again, I wanna to refer to this lecture given by one of the most prominent virologists in the world named Skip Virgin. And he gave an update on what we actually know about viruses. So a virus is a piece of genetic material, either a DNA or an RNA. Sometimes it has other proteins in it. And then it has a capsule which is made out of the cell membrane of the host cell. In other words, your cell. So what, what he was bringing up is that even in this example of chickenpox, it turns out that we have a virome, much like we have a microbiome. And we have essentially all of these pieces of RNA and DNA in our cells, in our genetic material. And they say 20% of our actual chromosomes are so-called junk, or now they say they actually are viruses it, that have merged with our DNA. So, and when you go back to this PCR test and realize that 100% of people, if you look hard enough, will have essentially every sequence there is. And so, the newer theory of this, and the theory that I think is the most reasonable, is that if you poison a cell and you cause degradation of their genetic material, either RNA or DNA, that will cause the production of millions of copies of this uh, poisoned DNA, and the body will package that up, and it will become as if it's a messenger sent by the poison cell to the other cells, the other tissues, even the other uh, people around it, and maybe even to other species. In other words, we know that this, these so-called viruses are not free living. They emerge from within your cell, and we, we think they emerge when you have broken DNA. So, Essentially, the question here is, is this coming from inside because you're poisoned, or is this an actual infection coming from outside? Now, it's also possible that it could be both or either one in different situations. But we also know, and as he pointed out, 
This is becoming more and more accepted. It's called exosome theory, where the body uh, is poisoned. It generates these viral particles, these pieces of DNA, which it encapsulates. It sends them as a messenger to the other members of the species, to the other cells, even to other uh, beings of other species, saying there's a new danger in town. You should defend yourself. This, interestingly, is exactly what trees do. Because if you get a beetle infestation of a tree in a forest, that tree makes messengers. They're not exactly like viruses because they're not pieces of the genetic material, but they're chemical or hormonal messengers, which then are secreted by the roots of the tree. It's picked up by the other trees, and the other trees make an immunological reaction to defend themselves against this new attack. Uh, it's, it's, as he described it, these, quote, viruses are the rapid deployment system because the, the usual sort of mutation theory of waiting for selection of, or survival of the fittest is way too slow. And so the organisms have learned to send out these pieces of genetic material as messengers to get other members of the species to do something. Now, the problem with this, because this gets very complicated, of course, and this is where Rudolf Steiner described that these, uh, these viruses are actually poisons or messengers secreted by your cell to have an effect on the world, telling the world that there's some new danger afoot. This is an amazingly intricate communication system when seen rightly how Rudolf Steiner knew that and how he knew exactly what modern virologists are saying, I have no idea. But the fact that he predicted this is pretty amazing. Now, you can imagine then that it, the problem with when you say, well, this looks like contagion because many people in the same place get sick. So the first thing I would say about that is the fact that many people in the same place get sick clearly and absolutely does not pr prove contagion. Just imagine, you know, in Hiroshima in 1945, I think, they dropped a bomb and a lot of people in the same place got sick. That was not an infection. That was not a virus. And over time, the radiation spread to other villages and prefects, and then they got sick, and neither was that an infection. And they were seeing the same set of diseases, but that was not an infection. The same thing happened in Chernobyl. You started in one place, a lot of people in the same place got sick, and then it started spreading, and people all over West, uh, Eastern Europe started to get sick. So the argument that the same people in the same place get sick does not, is not part of Koch's postulates. That's not how we prove infectious etiology. But here's where it's interesting. If it's true that if somebody is poisoned and they send out this messenger to their friends, you should do something about this, their friends might also make an immunological reaction and they look like they're being sick. And it is a sort of contagion in this sense, but not in any true sense of the word. And I would propose that that's actually what's happening right now. Now, the next question then, as I said, I can speculate on what may be the source of this poison. But as I said in, the, in this other talk, I, I just want to reiterate that there is good precedent and common sense in thinking these diseases which we're ascribing to infectious etiology are actually poisons. And one of the examples I gave is if you were a world famous dolphin doctor and you knew about the dolphins in somewhere, the Galapagos Islands, I don't even know if they have dolphins there, but I presume they do, or somewhere, and then they were always fine. And then they called you and said, a bunch of dolphins all in the same place are getting sick. And then they said, you can come here, but you can only ask one question about what's happening. And the questions are, A, does it have, a, these dolphins have a genetic disease? B, do the dolphins have a virus? Or C, 
did somebody put some toxic stuff in the water? And I think most of you would agree that C is almost 100% of the time what happened. And here's another example. When I was growing up outside of my window in suburban Detroit, there across the street, there was a wetlands. And in the wetlands were all these frogs and they made all this racket and I couldn't sleep at night and they bothered me, but I liked the frogs anyways. And then around when I was eight or so, all the frogs died and they didn't make a racket. And at least I could sleep, but I was very sad for the frogs. Now, again, if you were a frog doctor and you went to investigate, what could be the problem? A, they could have a genetic disease of which there's no evidence. B, they had a viral infection of which there's no evidence. Or C, somebody put DDT in the water and that killed the frogs. And in fact, that's what happened. So the question is, what is the Exxon Valdez or what is the DDT in this current situation? Now again, this is somewhat speculation because essentially nobody is really looking into this or at least very few people. And I get all kinds of information now and all kinds of contradictory things, but here's what I think. So number one, let's look at the situation in Northern Italy and in Wuhan. So number one, these were two of the most polluted air pollution places in the world. If you look at pictures, you can hardly see the ground because there's so much toxic particulate matter in the air in both places. In fact, to make it even more interesting, a good friend of mine who's one of the experts in glyphosate research in the world, said that in Italy in particular, and a lot of Europe, they have fairly recently had a dramatic shift to uh, biodiesel, which is uh, supposedly the sort of green uh, fuel of the future. And so they're burning this biodiesel made from corn and all that biodiesel exhaust is going into the air. Now, I don't know if you wanna take a guess as to how much of that corn that's used to make biodiesel fuel is made from biodynamic corn. But I can tell you, I have a very good guess, and the answer is none of it. This is, this is GMO corn, all heavily sprayed with glyphosate, which gets into the body of the corn, which is spewed out into the exhaust, which has the effect of degrading the DNA in our cells, we know that, and so that this degraded DNA is possibly being packaged up by the cells, and that's very similar to what we call viruses. And because it's a new phenomena, it looks like a, quote, novel virus. So that's one explanation. Another one is from my eyewitness people in both places, through me or through people that I know, they're saying that in both of those places, they rolled out a massive vaccination program in the weeks, months, and year leading up to this. Now, what happens then is you're basically injecting heavy metals, particularly aluminum, into people, which also has a neurotoxic and genotoxic effect. We know that from research. And we're putting all kinds of other metallic particles in the air, like aluminum as part of you know, this sort of geoengineering program. Now, am I 100% sure there's geoengineering? I wouldn't say that, but I think there's very good evidence that that's happening. Now, so this is all things that are happening in the air, which affects people's lung function and affects the integrity of their genes, which is actually exactly what Carrie Mull said you can use a PCR test for. If you have uh, accelerated degradation of your genes, then you'll have a lower uh, you know, act, uh, cycles until you catch it. So if you do something to a person and they only find it after 40 cycles, and then you do something and they only find it after 35, that usually demonstrates they have less degradation of their genetic material. It doesn't mean that was the cause, just less, uh, it's, it's less degradation. So we're putting in at least three things that we know of in those spots that are degrading the genes, causing the, the body to secrete these poisons, 
and also affecting lung function. And then from everything I can gather, there's a new sheriff in town called a new rollout of accelerated 4G and 5G radio frequencies. Now, there's two things we know about that. One is that radio frequencies of whatever sort cause accelerated degradation of the genetic material, exactly what we're seeing here. And number two, in particular, the 5G interferes with the integrity of the oxygen in the air, so the oxygen becomes less bioavailable, which will result in deterioration of the lung function. So here we have a situation where the symptoms are degradation of the DNA or RNA in this case, and poor lung function and trauma to the lungs causing bleeding and other symptoms of dry cough. And that is exactly what you would predict from these new toxic insults that are happening particularly in those places. Now you then could postulate that the body then sends signals out to the world, hey, we have a problem here. This is a new influence, which is also spreading all over the world. This, the, the 5G system was rolled out on that cruise ship. The 5G system was rolled out at the nursing host home in Washington, where this su supposed outbreak happened. And so while I wouldn't say that that's proof of my theory, I would certainly say, given the history of the relationship between new electromagnetic fields and viral outbreaks or pandemics or epidemics, all of which is meticulously outlined in the book, The Invisible Rainbow by Arthur Furstenberg, I think it's extremely irresponsible for us to not question whether this is involved. And if it is involved, or if any of these things are involved, that is something that is of urgent need to do something about, because this is an essentially a existential threat to all of us if we continue on with this glyphosate toxicity, aluminum toxicity, and new and accelerated electromagnetic smog poisoning of the, the entire earth. So I'm going to stop there as far as my explanation of what's causing this. But then I want to just say, uh, a lot of people then, of course, ask me, so Tom, what do you think we should do about this? And uh, there's a lot of other questions. And by the way, I'm not here to give anybody any particular medical advice or to say, whether or not you should follow certain guidelines or not. I'm here to explain my point of view about what's happening here. I'm also not right now interested in who's in exploring the political or who's doing this or anything that's, that's sort of speculation. I, I'm simply not going there. But let me just conclude by saying I actually have two things which I am very confident, I would say almost 100% confident, will, if you take these seriously and follow my suggestion here, will help you in this, in this time right now and in the coming days. And there's not too many things which I can say that about. And one of the reasons I can say that is because these two things came not from me, but from two very wise people in, who I'm in contact with, one directly, one indirectly in my wife, in my life. The first one came from uh, my wife. Um, and she had the experience yesterday. She was going shopping at our local food co-op and she came out, everybody of course is standing in line six feet apart and they're only letting certain people in at a time. And so there's all this whole lineup of people six feet apart. And she goes in, does her shopping, comes out with three heavy bags. I wasn't with her. And she comes out and she sees this elderly uh, uh, African-American gentleman who is lying on the floor, on the ground outside the store, bleeding from his head because apparently he fell or passed out or she didn't see exactly what happened. 
but he was lying on the floor, dazed and confused and bleeding. Now, here's the interesting part of this story. There was number of people in line, like 10, 20, I don't know how many, and none of them did or said anything. My guess is, like most people here in San Francisco, all those people stayed either staring or looking at their cell phones. Nobody called 911. Nobody said, are you okay? Nobody said, what happened? They were paralyzed with fear and uh, attached to their cell phone. So my wife went up and asked, went to him, tried to help him get up or called 911, I'm not sure exactly the sequence, and found his wife who then she, who she came, helped him, and then somebody else eventually helped come up and help him. And hopefully he got some help to find out what happened and you know, so hopefully he's okay. So here's my first suggestion here. We need to find our humanity here. And my suggestion of that is find out what it means to be human and if at all possible, find somebody who's less fortunate than you are and help them out. And I guarantee that will help your life. I'm not saying it's a cure for this current situation, but I'm saying as strongly as I can that if we lose our humanity and if we fail to even care about somebody who's bleeding on the ground, fail to even get off our cell phones, fail to ask somebody who's less fortunate than we are, if there's anything neighbor we can do to help, then we are lost. So that's the first thing. You can, everybody can do that. It doesn't cost you anything. Find somebody less fortunate than you are and help them out. The second thing comes from a verse from Rudolf Steiner. It's called A Verse for Our Time. Now this was sometime in the early part of the 20th century, so he didn't obviously do it now. But it gives you an exact blueprint of what you can do right now to help yourself. And so I'm going to read it. We must eradicate from the soul all fear and terror of what comes towards man out of the future. We must acquire serenity in all feelings and sensations about the future. We must look forward, forward with absolute equanimity to everything that may come. And we must think only that whatever comes is given to us by a world directive full of wisdom. It is part of what we must learn in this age, namely to live out of pure trust, without any security in existence, trust in the ever-present help of the spiritual world. Truly, nothing else will do if our courage is not to fail us. And let us seek the awakening from within ourselves every morning and every evening. In other words, let us learn to live out of trust. The world is sending us what we need. It is exactly mirrored in these viruses, which are sending out messages that we cannot live like this anymore. So with that, I think I will stop and we have hopefully a half an hour that uh, Alyssa our good friend can try to ask some of the questions that maybe I didn't address. And again, I really appreciate everybody's support and wisdom. And uh, there you go. All right. Uh, that was a great talk, Tom. Um, so one of the most asked questions was, what is the best way for us to protect ourselves from 5G and its effects? So that's a great question, and I am not an EMF expert. I'm not a building biologist. I know something about that, which is that you have to test and you have to shield your room. And, and one of the things I didn't say here is I wrote, I just finished writing a book called The Cancer and the New Biology of Water. And what I proposed in there is that, that, that 
uh, cancer is essentially a problem of cellular water. For those who don't uh, agree with me or are not convinced, I would only point out that we have a test that many of you, or probably all of you, have heard of called an MRI. And an MRI is how we find cancer. And if you ask your doctor, so what does an MRI measure? They will say something like, well, it measures whether you have a tumor. But obviously, it's not measuring that. It's measuring something. It turns out what it's measuring is the relaxation phase of water. In other words, the MRI was developed because of the work of Gilbert Ling, who I refer to as the founder of this cellular water theory. And uh, basically, out of his work, the, the, essentially the mechanism, the tools, the software for, a, for measuring the cellular water relaxation phase and integrating that into a picture that tells you whether your knee is messed up or whether you have a tumor. So anybody who says that tumors to cancer or arthritis or anything has nothing to do with cellular water is just un uninformed about, about the actual physiology. Now, the reason I say this in relation to 5G is I have very good evidence, which, uh, and please don't ask me to send you the reference on this. It's much too complicated for this. I, I will write something about this in due time. But I have very good reason to believe that the, cell, the water in the nucleus actually determines the structure and function of the DNA. So let's flesh this out a little bit. You have this double helix of nucleic acids. And what determines its, its shape in nature is this column of structured water running down the middle and surrounding the DNA. And as long as things are okay, then the DNA is expressed in the right way. And when I say okay, I mean the water is properly structured. If you do something to destructure the water, and it's very clear from the research that the thing that destructures the water most intensely is non-native electromagnetic fields, in other words, EMFs, in other words, 4G, 5G, and all the other Gs, even dirty electricity. This destructures the water and creates abnormal expression of the DNA which is what we see as viruses. I cannot emphasize that enough. That is the most modern theory of what a virus is. It's a piece of DNA or RNA that has been degenerated or degraded or the body is using as a messenger. I keep saying that because that's the key to understanding this. If you degrade the water with exposure to electromagnetic fields, you get a twisted crystal instead of a perfect structure. So the answer to the question of how do you protect yourself against any kind of toxic insult, but especially 5G or any of the other Gs, is by maintaining a pure water structure in your body, in your, in your cells. Now, that's complicated because A, you have to drink pure water. You have to be exposed to the electromagnetic fields that humanity and all the other living beings evolved with, which is the sun and the earth and other beings and the sheep and the grass and Jupiter and all the rest. Uh, and so we have degraded our exposure to healthy electromagnetic fields and substitute that for, de for fields that degrade our DNA. Uh, I think that's all I'm gonna say about that because I, there is no simple prescription for that, but that's something that I will probably have to have either another one of these and talk specifically about how to help yourself structure the water in your cells. For now, I would just look at um, my Cancer and New Biology of Water book because essentially that's what that was all about. Ready for the next question? Yep. Okay, um, can you give your best advice on how to strengthen our immunity during this crisis? I, so 
I mean, the first question is, is this an immunological crisis? This is, a, you know, again, the, the body sends out signals. These are toxic messages. They're, they're messages of danger. We call them viruses. And your immune system reacts. The, the, the thing that I don't want to get into is people saying, how do I strengthen my immune system? And the thing that I worry about is, you're putting the emphasis in the wrong place. And here's an example of that. And I'm sure many of you, if not all of you, you know, it's like, I think Tom is getting seen out because he keeps saying the same thing over and over again. Uh, maybe I am, or maybe I'm not, I don't know. I'll leave you guys to decide that. But um, here's, the, here's an example. You get a splinter in your finger and you don't take it out. Then your immune system generates pus in order to get the splinter out. And then you said, wow, I have a big pus thing. And even it could be that the pus and the immune reaction is so intense that it actually causes an infection in the bone and then maybe in the blood, and then you've got a big problem. So it turns out though, that it wasn't the immune system that caused this. In fact, having an overactive immune response may not be a good thing always, because the problem is the splinter. And I can't say that enough. The problem is the poison. The reaction is the virus. That's the messenger. And then the message stimulates an immune response, which sometimes can get too exuberant and do you harm. So if you focus, uh, uh, focusing on the immune system is saying, well, I'm just going to keep putting splinters in there and then I'm going to strengthen my immune system to get them out. I mean, that, that, that is a wonky strategy. That's the strategy of you keep, you're going to keep smoking to put splinters in your lungs, and then at twice a year, you're going to make an immune response to get it out. I mean, you can do that, and maybe it'll work, uh, but at some point, either you won't be able to generate a sufficient immune response, or uh, the immune response might get too exuberant, and then you're in trouble that way. So I don't want people to focus on the immune response. This is a toxic event. At least that's my hypothesis. Okay. Um, the next one, a lot of people are asking, how can we ensure fresh produce and meat are safe to eat? It, what was the last part? Meat, what? Uh, uh, that fresh produce and meat are safe from the virus. Oh, meat are safe. Meat, yes. Meat, yeah. I mean, as far as I know, nobody is even thinking that uh, this uh, virus lives on or is transmitted by vegetables or meat. So I don't think that's an issue. Okay, perfect. Um, also, a big question was... Um, Sorry. How much safety does the N95, uh, N95 mask offer? So that question uh, supposes that it's a virus that's contagious. And uh, again, it's complicated because there's a message out in the world that we're in trouble, that there's a new genotoxic event happening. And you know, as I've said, it isn't necessary, in if, if these viruses are actually, again, as the current modern conception is, is, is tending towards and is suggesting, these are toxic excretions of the cell, or as I like to say in my own weird way of putting things, it's the body is pooping out poisons. It's obviously not good to eat other people's poop. Uh, so you may not want to go around a sick person and particularly inhale all their toxic excretions. Uh, again, that doesn't mean it's the cause. I keep going back to the, the viral cause, the infectious cause has not, not been attempted, let alone proven. Uh, having said that, I don't personally put a lot of stock in washing your hands to get you know, all these viruses off because I think that's a futile undertaking or mask. Uh, but I don't want to tell anybody not to do that. I mean, we all have to, you know, quote, follow the laws and we all have to use our best judgment as to how, what we need to do to make ourselves feel safe. 
I'm just trying to expand the conversation here. Okay. Um, a big one is, is zinc helpful in all of this with COVID-19 virus? If so, what's the best kind and dosage? I had this question a lot. Yeah, I have no idea because A, I, I obviously question the vital, the viral etiology of this whole thing. And I can't, I, I can't see any justification at this point in saying chloroquine, vitamin C, mushrooms, or anything is, you know, is, is a specific treatment for this situation. Now, what I would say is there is good justification now, just like there was a week ago, just like there was six months ago, just like there was two years ago, just like there was 20 years ago, for people, for instance, to eat a nourishing traditions diet. Why? Because if you eat any other diet, you're basically being malnourished or poisoned. So that isn't good for you. Now, let me say another thing. Uh, I didn't exactly spell this out in my water book, but if you think about it, you know, because this has a lot to do with water, because this is the medium of life, and it's the medium that the electromagnetic fields directly impact. So my, my basic theory is that humans drank water and water was considered, quote, the good. In other words, before, say, three, 400 years ago, here were the characteristics of water. Number one, there was no toxic stuff dissolved in the water because they didn't put toxic stuff in the water. Number two, the water... So no stuff in the water. Number two, the water always had minerals in it because the water came up out of the earth, what we call springs, or was running over the rocks and the rivers and streams. And so it slowly dissolved the minerals over time. So we have no stuff, mineralized water. That's step two. Step three is uh, the water was always flowing, particularly in vortex patterns. And this did two things. Number one, it structured the water. Number two, it oxygenated the water. Interestingly, the entire oxygen level of our atmosphere is approximately one to 2% lower than it was say 300 years ago. There's a lot of reasons for that and people may dispute that number and you can go find it for yourself. Uh, so, but the water was also highly oxygenated as is the water in healing places like Lourdes and the Ganges, there's an extraordinarily high percentage of dissolved oxygen in the water. Uh, now people say, well, we don't absorb the oxygen, but we do know that the oxygen in the water stimulates the healthy growth of bacteria. In fact, it stimulates specifically the beneficial bacteria in our gut, and that is our immune system, and that is what is responsible for our health. So while the oxygen in the water may not get absorbed in your blood, there's still many other mechanisms of how it could help your health, particularly by stimulating a healthy microbiome. But so the next, so again, the third step is water that's moving in vortexes, which may, allows it to pick up oxygen. The fourth step is all this water was exposed to the electromagnetic field of the earth, and the sun and the planets and the stars and the birds and the bees and the frogs and everything else. Now, therefore, we evolved or were created or whatever you want, whatever image you want to use to every time we drink water, we think that must be good. I'm going to absorb it into my cells. But let's look at modern water like San Francisco water or any water on the planet. First of all, it's got an extraordinary amount of toxic stuff. It's got glyphosate in it. It has chlorine, it has chloramine, it has neurotoxic fluoride, it has birth control pills, it has pesticides, it has Prozac, it has statin drugs. You can demonstrate it, you can prove it. 
we, all the water has microplastics in it. You can demonstrate that, it's not hard. So we have water with stuff in it. Then most of the water is demineralized or not the right kind of minerals or people even drink distilled water, which is acidic, dead water. And so we don't have the right minerals in the water. Third of all, the water isn't moving and it has an extraordinary low level of oxygen, which creates a toxic microflora in our gut. And fourth of all, it is not sung to in any way. There is no spirit or fields or however you want to think of this that's influencing the water to structure it to be the healthy living crystal that is the basis of all life. And so the, the reason I'm saying that is, you know, what should you do? You should drink healthy uh, water in the way that I described. Now, I, I don't want this to be any sort of infomercial kind of thing, but I can guarantee you I will be talking more about what kind of water and how you can do that in the coming weeks and days and et cetera. But I just want to lay out the principles now. So that's another thing you can do. You can expose yourself to the sun and the earth. It's called earthing. Go for a walk in, on the beach. Hold hands with somebody you love because we, get, we transfer healthy electromagnetic fields from one person to another. Play with your dog. Play with your children. Hold your children. Cultivate a garden. I just heard a song yesterday by uh, Willie Nelson's son. I don't know if anybody has heard this. And it said something like, please turn off the fucking news and go plant a garden. So I think he's right. Well, to kind of um, go off of your last question and explanation, a lot of questions were, what kind of regular detoxification do you recommend, um, especially with the water? Yeah. Well, I recommend saunas with a, uh, here's an infomercial part about a company called saunaspace.com because, you know, as I described in the vaccine book, if you have toxic water in your cell, the way the body does it is it heats up. And so imagine you have a cell is like jello and now somebody put a poison grape in your jello and you want to get the poison grape out. What you do is you heat up the jello, that dissolves it, and then you flush it out. So first comes a fever, and then comes snot, and that flushes the jello, the poison grape out, and then you reconstitute a more perfect gel. And you can replicate that situation with, you know, a sauna space sauna, or with exercise, or any kind of sweating, but particularly a sweating where you're not actually moving your muscles, because that seems to work better. So that's one way. You know, there's various other techniques for helping yourself structure water. You know, I'm investigating, you know, Schauberger came up with a, a, a implosion device, which is lined with crystals that you can put the water through and that creates a vortex. There's companies that are making, uh, you know, water that has no stuff in it, has the right kind of minerals, etc. So we'll be getting into that. Um, other ways of detoxifying are getting enough sleep and helping somebody who's less fortunate than you are. Okay. Um, another one is once a vaccine is created for the coronavirus, what uh, would you advise your patients to do? Think long and hard about that. <laughs> I'll leave it at that. Okay. All right. Um, a lot of my questions you've already answered, but another main one was if someone has already had the coronavirus, how long are they immune to it or do they continue to be immune to it? So that's, you know. the, <laughs> that's the trouble. You know, I spend the first hour talking about my, my, my criticism of the theory um, all I can say is, it, you know, when I was in medical school, and 
you know, it wasn't, I'm not, I mean, I'm an old guy, but I'm not like, you know, 900 years old. So it wasn't like 1820. So we're talking about the 1980s. There was two things that we learned then. One, bacteria are bad. There was no good bacteria in a human being. Therefore, one of the treatments that we learned about and used was we would sterilize a person's body with basically high doses of antibiotics. This is where we were 40 years ago in medicine. Now, of course, that never worked and the people died, uh, but we, we didn't think there was such a thing as good bacteria. Now we know that there's more good bacteria, so-called, in our bodies than there are human cells in our body, which is an existential question of who do you think you are? Because more of your genetic material inside you turns out to be actually bacteria. And then now we know there's an, also a virome, like a microbiome, with millions of, of viruses with essentially a piece of every genetic material there is on the planet. That's why these tests are positive if you get them sensitive enough. Uh, so, that's, so those are the kind of things we thought not so long ago. We also thought that if you had cancer, we should irradiate your bone marrow so that we could give you a bone marrow transplant and that would help your cancer. And we found out that that didn't work and everybody died. So everybody died with the, uh, with, we tried to sterilize and everybody died who we tried to kill their, micro, you know, their bone marrow. And Alyssa, what was the question again? Um, sorry, I just lost it on here. What kind of regular detox? Nope, sorry, I've lost my place here. Apologies. Yeah. A anyways, oh, 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 oh if someone you, has, right, right. has no, had it, it, if they're immune yeah, to it, right? So, and so, so that's one thing we learned there's no such thing as beneficial microorganisms. So, that of course turned out to be complete nonsense. The other thing we learned is that. If you have a viral disease, and now we're talking about standard virus theory, you get a virus from the outside, it injects itself into your cells, it takes over your genetic machinery, makes millions of copies of itself, and then spreads to other people. That's standard virus theory. Once you've had it, you recognize one of the uh, parts of the virus, and you make antibodies to it so that you never get sick from that virus again right? That's standard mm -hmm. theory. So I was joking with another old guy doctor and we were saying, this was before this whole thing, what do you remember from immunology and virology from medical school? And this is like 40 years ago. And we both said the same thing. If you have antibodies, you're immune. That's what we used to, if you've had chicken pox, if you've had antibodies, you're immune. If you have whatever, you have antibodies, you're immune. And then, you know how we all remember where we were on 9-11 and we all remember the day, where we were the day John Kennedy was killed, et cetera. I remember the day walking out of medical school with a friend, 1984, that was when I graduated, when they announced that they found the cause of AIDS. It was a virus called HIV. And what did they, how did they know that the virus caused it? Because they never saw it. They never saw millions of copies. They never purified it. They never transmitted it. So question then, how did they find out that this was caused by a virus? Answer, they found some of the people, and I want to emphasize, some of the people with uh, AIDS had antibodies to this uh, virus called HIV. And I remember specifically turning to my friend and saying in my ridiculous way, hey, who changed the rules? Because I just spent four years learning that if you have antibodies, that means you're immune. And then they say, well, the, but the virus is a wily foe and it knows how to escape even the antibodies. Now think about that. A virus is a piece of RNA in that case, maybe some other proteins, and a capsule that comes from your cells. So exactly which is the wily part of that? You know, a wily means this virus is thinking I want to escape detection. And I know 
you could say it's an, a selection thing, you know, survival of the fittest, but it's somehow after that, we decided, and I don't know who the we is, but not me, decided that you could test somebody for antibodies, and some of the time you can tell them they're immune, and some of the time you tell them that means you have the virus. And I, frankly, I can't figure out when you're supposed to tell them that and when you're not. It seems, as far as I can see, pretty much completely arbitrary. So it, it, the other interesting thing is I have very good information that when people do this PCR test for the coronavirus, they test positive, and then they test negative, and then they test positive, and then they test negative, and then there was somebody who tested positive again. And that's nuts. And then you, you'll have people who have uh, antibodies, which means they're immune, except then they might tell us that in this case, like hep C, it means you have antibodies, but you're not immune. So who decides whether they're immune or not immune? Frankly, I don't know. So when you get to understanding or investigating at this level, you, people have to realize there's no way to answer this question because the question is framed in a way to make you think in a certain thing which actually doesn't square up with reality. So I don't know how to answer that question. I don't know what test they're going to use. I don't know what evidence they're going to base it on. And so I don't know. Okay. I think we have one more question here. And I would say the biggest question, question currently um, that I'm getting over the Q&A is why does social distance, distancing work? Who says it does? <laughs> <laughs> That's a good way to put that. Okay, everybody. Um, I, right. I'm not telling anybody uh, what to do. I'm explaining my point of view. And, and I certainly don't think you know, given the situation, you should walk up in somebody's face and, you know, be obnoxious. We're trying to help people out. We need to create a new world. And I'm going to steal a line from a guy I used to know years ago, Charles Eisenstein, who said, we all know in our hearts that a new, that a new and better and different world is possible. Somehow we have to find the courage and the insight and the strength to create it together. And with that, I really want to appreciate everybody's interest and support. And it's going to be very interesting to see where this leads. So God bless us all. All right. Thank you, Tom. Um, I'm going to go Thank ahead and everybody. shut us off. All right. Okay. Thank Bye. you. Bye-bye.